Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am very pleased uh, to, to have the opportunity to introduce uh, Victor Dover uh, to you all today. I actually, and I'm Kristen Larson, I'm the director of the School of Landscape Architecture and Planning. And I actually first met Victor Dover when he and his partner, Joseph Cole, in 1993, had been hired as consultants by the city of Orlando. I was working there as a planner and their firm Dover Cole and Partners was hired to develop a revitalization plan for the Paramore neighborhood in that city. The planning process involved significant neighborhood outreach and applying new urbanist concepts to community revitalization. It was adopted by the city council in 1994. I have returned to that plan in my research on Orlando and in teaching about the new urbanism as a revitalization tool in my graduate planning courses. Now, let me share with you a bit more about uh, Victor's significant background and expertise beyond this personal uh, experience with him. So Victor Dover is an urban designer and co-author of Street Design, The Secret to Great Cities and Towns, which was published in 2014. He is an expert on how to redesign our neighborhoods and fix our streets and in the process, shape enduring cities that people really love. For 33 years, the Dover Cole and Partners Firm has been designing walkable, livable neighborhoods. In 2000, the Dover Cole team created the City of Gainesville's plan for University Heights. They also devised the plans for neighborhoods like Ion in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, and Glenwood Park in Atlanta, plus street redesigns for quarters, including Park Avenue in Winter Park and Clematis Street in West Palm Beach. Their large-scale projects also include Plan El Paso, hailed as America's best smart growth plan and 750, which is something I really um, encourage you to take a look at. That's the 50 year regional plan for the seven counties of Southeast Florida. Dover is best known for revitalization plans like the one that transformed the historic Southside neighborhoods in Chattanooga. In recognition of this work, Dover and Cole were awarded the Congress for the New Urbanism Florida's John Nolan Medal for contributions to urbanism. Victor received his Bachelor of Architecture degree from Virginia Tech, and he is also an adjunct faculty member at the University of Miami School of Architecture, from which he received his master's degree. Victor is a CNU fellow and a fellow of the American Institutes of Certified Planners, is vice president of the Parks Foundation of Miami-Dade, and also a board member of the National Recreation and Parks Association. He is also a five-time Ironman triathlete and veteran marathoner who uses hikes, rides, and runs to size up the pedestrian friendliness and cycle worthiness of the many towns he visits each year he regularly produces new short films under the banner, Town Planning Stuff Everyone Needs to Know, available on the Dover Cole YouTube channel. And with that said, I will go ahead and uh, turn it over to Victor to provide us with his keynote today. Thank you so much, Victor. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much, Kristen, for that introduction. And I am thrilled to participate uh, today. Thank you. Uh, all coming in good uh, audio wise and everything so far. You're Kristen? good. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, always, you know, Zoom, always a good idea to check right before, right before we begin talking for half an hour. Well, thanks again for the invitation to participate in today's event. I'm I'm thrilled to any time I can interact with the uh, uh, university and um, it's just a deep gratitude on my part for a chance to show you some of what we've been thinking about lately. Um, I like to say that in our practice, we're in the before and after business. We spend a lot of time helping people start with what they know very well, the world that's around them, and then visualize what they want it to be. And that, uh, that's really what planning is. That's what urban design is. That's what architecture is. The before and after business of helping people squint and in their mind's eye, imagine what they want their town to be when it grows up. 
And uh, that's a fertile area for research, actually. Uh, as citizens, we're not all that good at participating in the process that I just described uh, in, in, in North America in particular. Um, we're, we're still learning how to do it, aren't we? Because we have, if, if we were good at it, we would be getting cities we love a lot more, a lot more often. I also want to do a quick shout out to uh, my uh, good colleague at University of Florida student, Sophia Palumbo, who's in the audience today, who was a diligent summer intern in our firm uh, all summer long, uh, helping advance the research that we've been doing, um, and also part of a lot of conversations about what neighborhoods really need to be like in the near future uh, if we are to offer Americans car light or car optional or even car free lifestyles. So with that, uh, if you'll go to the next one, um, Lauren, the, uh, I like to think of this in terms of asking questions. Sometimes when I introduce myself, I will say I'm an urban designer or a town planner. Um, uh, but sometimes I also say I'm a troublemaker, I'm a question asker, because I ask the questions that will provoke people into thinking that maybe the things that they thought were givens or set in the world are actually subject to their uh, their will and desire and change. And if we wanted it to be different, they could be different. And I think that for a long time, Americans have been asking exactly the wrong questions about our built environment. Next. For example, we tend to ask, you know, it might be the we in this case, might be our elected officials. It might be the staff in our various transpocracies. Uh, it might be the planning department or it might be a developer, but they tend to ask, you know, what can we do to get that traffic moving? Because people are frustrated that they're stuck in it. And we, we ask the question uh, as if it's a given that what we must as society and as local governments and as neighborhoods what, and as developers, what we must do is find a way to solve the plight of the person who insists on driving a car alone over long distances, who at peak hour will therefore be stuck in traffic. That's not the right question. Next. Another version of that question is, given that growth is occurring and life is changing and we have gone from being somewhat car dependent to extremely car dependent, we're gonna have more and more traffic. So how can we keep more and more traffic moving no matter what the cost. I would like to suggest to you that that's those two are exactly the wrong question. We should be asking, how can we have fewer people moving fewer miles while still enjoying a dynamic and successful economy and a prosperous high quality of life? That's the actual question. And you know, you don't, in urban design, we don't get to work on transportation by itself or on land use by itself or on the design of the public realm and streets um, and neighborhoods by themselves. We actually have to think about them all at the same time. This land use, transportation, and urban design as a unit. And when we just think about the transportation part, we look at the people stuck in traffic and we say, how can we get them moving? What we actually should be saying is, how can we have all of those uh, good things people do in cities like, um, make one another's cash registers ring or uh, contribute to society and participate in civic life or um, be with friends and family or go see a movie or any of those things. How can we do those things without filling up the world with traffic congestion? Next. Now, just to put, the, uh, to put this in perspective, this question, how can we reduce the car miles traveled per person? Let's see, let's examine just for a second how frustrated people actually are. Go to the next one. Um, they are stuck in traffic. Here's a, head, a famous headline from the Miami Herald not long ago, stuck in traffic and there's no way out, like no solutions are coming. It really just seems like there are too many of us trying to find space in the same lanes and in the same intersections at the same time. That's the definition of traffic congestion. Now go to the next one. Actually, you have to remember that your city is more than a collection of buildings that keep the rain off your head and, and land uses, those activities inside buildings or on parcels. A city is actually a messaging device. It's a tool for sending messages, a communications device. And if the message that you are sending is that 
unless you're in a car by yourself, you're doing it wrong, then people are gonna do that. If the message that you send by what you invest in and what you build is that you want more and more of them to do exactly that, then that is what they will do. If the message that you send by building the adult environment is that people are meant to be out in the public realm on foot, not given that walking is not a alternate mode of transportation as the traffic engineers sometimes like to call it, it is the original mode of transportation. And if you send a message through the design of your city that transit is something you want them to use and transit is cool, or that cycling is cool and cycling that cyclists are welcome, then you've sent a message that will help each of those people who choose those options to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Now in many cities, and this is a picture of London, you recognize the double-decker buses, transit is a defining characteristic at the forefront of the image of the city. For example, uh, if you step out of a building and into a street, you know, here's Piccadilly Circus, but you could be on Fleet Street, you could be on Great Oxford Street, it doesn't matter. And you see the, um, you know, the, the beautiful white buildings and the, the bright red double-decker buses. You, know, you grab your phone and you pull it out and you hold up the camera and you take a picture for Instagram. Isn't that cool? Um, I wonder when I look at the transit systems in North America, whether we are doing it in such a way that from a communications point of view, from a branding, public relations point of view, uh, and as a designed element in the city, we are taking that same care. Uh, I, I just quickly, do you have a mental picture of what the buses look like in Chattanooga, Tennessee? Does anybody know what the buses look like in New Orleans? Does anybody talk about what color the buses are in Philadelphia? Probably not. Let's go to the next one. The trouble is Americans have been hearing that we're running out of roads since at least 1947. Um, you can go on with that one. Then we're running out of roads. Next, Lauren. You know, we spend trillions adding capacity to the system, but all we actually succeeded in doing was convincing more and more of us to drive more and more. Think about that. But running out of roads. There was a famous uh, Jam Handy propaganda film uh, released throughout through in movie theaters through all, throughout the country uh, in the late 1940s, which uh, had the famous line in the narration, we're running out of roads. And, and then the next, the next sentence was, why in this country, for every uh, mile of road that's being built, two miles are wearing out. And that's really stuck with me because if you stop and think about what the narrator just said, for every mile of high of road, two miles are wearing out. That means that fully one third of the of the streets in the country were under construction at the time, trying to jam more cars into them, uh, which is an amazing thing if you think about how dramatically our continent was transformed in the decades that followed. Next. Now, what really happened was that we stopped building communities where it felt normal to be on foot. And then we succeeded in causing a shift from the family car, quite common by the early 1950s, to the personal car, one for each person over 16, maybe more than one for each person over 16. And we succeeded in making our households absolutely dependent on the car for everything. And as every time you make a trip, do anything, probably do it by car. Now, there are exceptions to this. Um, at university towns are, are one of those places where there are often exceptions. Um, we like to think uh, college students are the last great pedestrian population that never quite gave up. And then in college towns, um, we all have this mental picture of the professor in tweed cycling to class. Uh, so we know that in Gainesville, for example, that, and, and in, also I think Electoral County deserves a, a great deal of credit. The county and the city have been trying very hard not to let this go unnoticed. Let's go to the next slide. Now, the spending on road widening and highway building actually made the problem we were trying to solve worse. So I'm gonna issue a challenge about what we need to do instead. And for all the researchers in the audience, we need more facts and figures, more statistical evidence, more support for the, uh, for the question. There is a lot of science already in place. The, um, that induced travel demand, for example, as a phenomenon not understood when I was an undergraduate, but now very common in, uh, in transportation planning circles, 
people seem to understand that there was latent demand. And when you add capacity uh, to the highway, road and highway system, you're actually in, a, in an effort to try and make it feasible for people to go faster, you're actually making it more likely that they will roam farther in the same amount of time. And the result is more miles traveled, more congestion at the peak hour, and yet more separateness and isolation in our individual vehicles. So next, this isn't just about the way we build streets. Um, it, it is that, it is the, the way we configure streets is really important. The way we make street oriented architecture is hugely important. And I'll talk about that as well in a few moments. Um, it is about the way we build streets, but it's not just about that. Next. It's also about the way we design the whole neighborhood. Um, trying to solve the problem of transportation in the modern city and, and congestion and waste that comes from over car dependence at the scale of an individual building might seem a little bit hard or at the scale of an individual street. I will say that these small decisions matter a lot. They add up to regional impacts. Let's say, for example, that you design the neighborhood kind of like the one shown here in the picture um, where the streets interconnect, the blocks are small. There's a number of things you can do within your neighborhood. Uh, and the, the system, the pattern of the city is permeable so people can move about. That's actually part of the solution. Let's suppose we took just one block there. And instead of making front porches and front doors, doors and windows and balconies and storefronts facing the street, we just had a blank wall. So we lost that architectural component. And we severed the building to street relationship in terms of human beings. Let's say that just academically, what if we were to take out the street trees on that block uh, because you know they got cut from the budget or it seemed like too much trouble. Um, if we, take, if we take those two examples, two items, even if there's a sidewalk there, because someone said in a, in a rule that you had to have a sidewalk, so some developer or engineer reluctantly included one of the absolute minimum size. You know, if we, if we had that no building to street relationship condition, and we had that no street tree condition, then we'd be setting it up as a foregone conclusion that people will drive instead of walk. And so even though that was a close-up decision made at the scale of an individual building, or at the scale of an individual street, we, we, we have created a situation where the people in that town are less likely to walk or bike or use transit. So it doesn't matter whether they'd be making a short trip within the neighborhood or a longer one outside, we've poisoned the well, we've made it impossible for them to continue. So that's what I mean by it's how we design neighborhoods. Next. It's also about how we shape our regions. You know, this means we need to set up uh, transit-oriented development in places where they make the region more convenient and less car dominated. That might be that on what was, you know, an era ago, uh, just a corridor for cars, it has to become a corridor for transit as well, or a corridor for, for uh, commuter cycling. And it means that in a place where just a few decades ago, we would have put one-story buildings sitting far apart, separated by parking lots, we need to bring buildings closer together. And, uh, and deliberately cause development to have impact on other development, as opposed to pushing everything farther apart in hopes of calming everybody down over the, over the controversy of development. Transit-oriented development means deliberately bringing things closer together instead of farther apart. So that, now that means you've got to take a look at your map as, of the region and actually design where concentrated development should be so that people have access to the whole of the region from that place and they also have the ability to live a high quality of life in that place with fewer trips. And when they do make trips, make them shorter. Next, it's also about rethinking the entirety of the, enti of the public realm, of the spaces between the buildings, which I made allusion to a little while ago. That includes the streets, of course, next, but it also includes the parks and the squares and the plazas and the greenways and trail networks uh, that connect it, next. And then so the, when, once you get to the neighborhood where you live or work or go to school, it's actually somewhere worth being. Now, this is Oakland Park in the center of the state. It's in uh, between Oakland and Winter Garden uh, along the West Orange Trail. And what you're looking at there isn't a street. That's actually part of the Orange County Trail Network called the West Orange Trail. Hugely popular, uh, one of the best of its kind in the whole country. And in the background of this picture, you see where the row of houses is. Those were built after the trail was installed. 
and um, for those who are, are work with home builders or developers, you probably know how Herculean a task it was to get this to happen. But once the trail was there, it was possible to convince those folks to turn the houses around and face the trail with the front porches and front doors of the of the buildings. So people could sit on their porches and watch the world go by. So you see people rollerblading or walking or running or, or biking by on the West Orange Trail. Actually, it, the installation of a good trail facility, high quality bike infrastructure, transformed the response on the part of developers and, and architects uh, in the adjacent land. So what? how's that for having a positive impact? Let's go to the next one. The highway infrastructure was intended to speed things up, to get us moving again, so we could finally go faster. But what really happened was it just encouraged us to use that time to go farther, as I alluded to before, uh, to drive till we qualify for a cheaper house that was on newly converted farmland farther out effectively pushing more sprawl outward and, uh, and encouraging in turn people to drive alone more and more. Next. All right, so now we get to look at the base clauses of, of congestion. It, 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 in order to talk about the symptoms, um, you know, we, you know, which I've been describing up till now, I think we have to look at the root causes uh, instead. The causes actually aren't hard to discern. Our daily activities are too far apart. Next. Um, and the way we configure the built environment itself discourages people from doing anything except driving. Uh, even in cities, this is not just purely a suburban phenomenon. I thought it'd be useful here to, com to compare um, the downtowns of Buffalo, Birmingham, and Chattanooga, uh, three Rust Belt towns, two of them in a Sun Belt location. The pink is parking. So they actually picked the city apart um, and decommissioned a lot of what should have been income producing city making land for building sites or green space. Uh, and instead it's just devoted to asphalt, that kind of continuous asphalt coating that we have come to take for granted. Next. The next cause is that our street networks are disconnected and tree-like um, and and they're, instead of grid-like, this forces each trip onto the same roads and intersections with everybody else at the same time. Go to the next one. Okay, so now you see the an example from the woodlands in Texas. This is just a diagram illustrating um, the underlying pattern of the street network here. And what you, you discern from this is that the scale of the, of the individual block is so vast that no one's really gonna walk all the way around it. And the street network itself is so sparse, even without the cul-de-sacs, the streets don't actually go somewhere that you're likely to need to go uh, as part of living your daily life. So that's how we end up getting forced onto the same roads and intersections with everybody else at the same time. Next. The next cause is that our auto-oriented street scenes are really hostile environments for walking and biking. Um, I shot this outside Charleston, but you really, unfortunately, you could take this picture almost anywhere in South Carolina. You could take this picture almost anywhere in North America, and you could find a similar corridor uh, near Gainesville or near Orlando or near somewhere else. Uh, they exist everywhere. But we see a person occasionally, which I managed to, to snap a quick picture of uh, when I saw this one. But if there's, a, if there's a pedestrian, a person on foot, they're more, more or less likely, or more likely, I guess, uh, to be walking uh, as a last resort. They're doing it because they have to. Either they just uh, don't have the money to wrap themselves in thousands of pounds of um, fiberglass and steel and petroleum um, to make the simple move of crossing the street. So they have to do it the old fashioned way on foot. And if you see somebody like that, chances are they are um, embarrassed or uh, made to look, made to feel less than human in that environment. They, so the message that the city is sending here, this communication device I started with in the beginning, uh, what do you think it is? It's that you're less than human. You're not fully qualified to participate in the wealth and success of society uh, if you don't have one of these vehicles around you. And I think that's a terrible shame. It's not just um, 
a uh, matter of transportation. It's you know, honestly, it's a matter of freedom and ought to be considered more than a city planning matter, it ought to be considered a civil rights matter. Now let's go to the next slide. Our, speaking of the causes of congestion, our transit alternatives are weak. This is actually a picture of a transit corridor. And you can see the, uh, the infrequent buses use the rightmost lanes extending from the top to the bottom of the screen. But the buses are so infrequent, you can't get a picture of one. Uh, or to, and, and very unlikely to get a picture of two of them at the same at the same moment, unless you fly your drone for a whole lot of batteries waiting for the picture. Uh, but look at all the cars using the using the corridor instead. Uh, now, how do you get to that transit stop that's seen right in the middle of the picture? Well, you walk way out of your way. You cross acres and acres and acres of asphalt. Uh, if you need if you're on the wrong side of the road, let's hope you were near the intersection that crosswalk we can see in the foreground, because the next one is miles upstream. Um, so, you know, there's transit here. We have transit, but the alternatives are weak. Next. I'm trying to put this in numerical perspective. Uh, here's a statistic that we learned from working on the 750 project that Kristen mentioned in the introduction. In Southeast Florida, we have about 750 people a day moving to the region. That's the seven counties of Southeast Florida, including uh, say from Key West to Vero Beach. They operate as really one continuous uh, stretch of asphalt uh, from between those corridors. The biggest ones, of course, are Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties. And uh, over in between now and 2060, uh, about a million and a half people will be moving or are expected to move uh, to Miami-Dade alone. And that's, uh, you know, 2040 will be up to about 600,000 more of them, and then more will follow them. So here's the challenge. If, we, if all of these people do what our parents did for decades and what we have done in, in many cases for decades, that is driving alone long distances for everything, the traffic's just gonna get a whole lot worse. We actually need them to pick a different set of habits and we need to think about making space uh, in our transportation system by choosing different habits ourselves. Next. So therefore, we need to get a bigger, much bigger, a much bigger percentage of those who are already live in a place like Miami-Dade and these new folks I was talking about to choose short local trips and walking trips and biking trips and transit trips much more often. Now, short local trips, those might be made by car, but why do they have to necessarily be made out on the regional road network, which is jammed with other travelers at peak hour? Well, because of the design of the neighborhoods. Let's go to the next one. It's already too hard to drive. I want you to think about it like this. When you're stuck in traffic, this just means there were just too many other people in cars trying to do the exact same thing you are in the same space. Cars take up a lot of space. Um, and you know they're not doing anything wrong. You're not doing anything wrong. Everybody is just trying to live the life that was set up, but it's actually unsustainable because as more of us um, arrive, and if we all do the same thing, the system fills up. There, let's go to the next slide. All right, thank you. Look at the amount of space that's taken by this interchange. And then you can see the strip shopping centers and office parks and, um, and you know, strip uh, commercial spaces and um, fast food restaurants and so on, through subdivisions and what have you that are sprinkled around it. I want you to conclude from looking at this slide is that there is a basic geometry problem to depending on cars for everything. And that basic geometry problem is that they take up too much space. Let's go to the next one. This is sort of a famous uh, slide that's been staged and restaged many times over the last 25 or 30 years. Uh, this particular one um, came from Calgary, but it's been staged and restaged many times. Probably some activists in Gainesville have already restaged it using one of your buses. But in this picture on the left, you can see how much space it takes for a busload of 40 or 60 um, of people to occupy that bus or trolley. And then in the center picture, you can see how much space it takes for the same number of us on bicycles. It's, it's slightly more, but not that much more. And in the photo on right, you see what happens when each person has a car, same number of people. But of course, now the geometry of, a, of the individual motorist 
it causes this to extend off the frame. You can't even get them all in, the, in your field of vision with the same camera if everybody has a car. So here's the discovery. There will never be enough room, no matter what we do. Next. Here's another way to visualize the same thing. On the upper left, 400 cars versus 400 bus passengers versus 400 people on a single train. Do you see why we think that the geometry problem of the car can't be solved as we add, if eventually we work the system uh, to the point of overload? Now, we can do things to squeeze more capacity out of a, out of a motoring network. We can use advanced uh, electronic signal timing, for example, which uses sensors to optimize the flow at certain intersections. Uh, that probably means it's going to, the cameras and sensors are going to detect which direction in that intersection has more people needing to jam through it, and it's going to give them more of the green time. But to make a long story short, yes, we can squeeze a little bit of capacity out by doing that. We can squeeze capacity out by widening lanes and adding lanes, or even grade separating interchanges and so on. But of course, as we do that, we eventually run out of room. Because when you're doing it out in the country, like the aerial photograph I showed a minute ago, it might feel like you got all the elbow room you need and the land was cheap and uh, the DOT paid for it with, with federal money or something. So that seems doable. But when you try to apply those same ideas to the city, you just figure the neighborhood. And in an attempt to get everybody moving, you destroy the adjacent land uses, wreck an economy, uh, wipe out whole neighborhoods. And when that was tried, as it was tried in many cities around our country, it was, a, it was um, visited upon the communities of least clout, um, poorer neighborhoods, African-American neighborhoods, neighborhoods of newly arrived immigrants. Um, and uh, we will spend the next couple of hundred years recovering from the trauma that was done for that. Now, if a train fills up, you can add another train comes a few minutes later. And the capacity growth, the stepwise capacity growth that's possible uh, with transit is so much better than the ability to grow stepwise capacity through cars. So let's go to the next one and just imagine how that might actually look on the ground. This is Richmond, Virginia, um, Hall Street in Richmond. And you can kind of tell from these old industrial buildings that at one time it was normal for even the workaday utilitarian buildings to have a certain dignity to them. But look at the, the uh, reduction in dignity all around that occurred as the city was picked apart during urban renewal, slash and burn, slum clearance, and so on. Now let's, because we're before and after people, let's think about what it could be next. Okay, so here's a what if for Hall Street. And here you see transit added in to make up for the loss in parking spaces that became building sites and the arrival of new people who need to move back and forth around that street. What I'm getting at is that you as architects or landscape architects or engineers or developers and investors or planners and regulators all have a role to play in making it legal, feasible, and likely that we can build our way out of our problems, actually grow the community that we want as part of solving the transportation debacle. Let's go to the next one. This space problem that I've been describing and I use the interchange to illustrate, uh, it's really the same with parking. By industry estimates, our cars are motionless and empty, just stored 94% of the time. Now, we have these relationships with our appliances. I mean, all of us have, or most of us have anyway, uh, these smartphones and we keep them with us, we keep them close to us, we keep them in our hand a lot of the time, um, and we take it with us everywhere we go and so on. But for about half a century or more, we've had a similar relationship with cars. We like to keep it right next to us. Um, we'd like to have our car as close as possible to our cafe table seat or to our movie theater seat or our desk and cubicle at the office or even our bed. In fact, we designed suburban houses with a whole big piece of the wall facing the street that at the touch of a button can lift up magically and allow you to pull the car right inside the house as close as possible to your bedside. Um, when I put it like that, it sounds kind of astonishing that we do it, doesn't it? Next. I have a habit of staring out of windows and taking pictures 
and then next, painting the parking. The amount of our cities, this is Atlanta, you can, it's a view you can get from the, the, from the Westin. Um, the, the percentage of our cities that are devoted to no productive activity, just the car sitting there stored in case we want to use it, is astonishing. Now, right under the percent sign, you can see a white building that I painted pink around. And I showed the slide in Atlanta. And I have to tell you, a guy jumped up in the audience and said, hold on, hold on a minute here. That's not accurate because that building is also parking. <laughs> I missed one. So it turns out that you know, there's an enormous amount of the city that is devoted solely to parking. Next. Now, uh, this is important physically and in terms of the composition of the city and the communications message that the city sends, uh, but it's also a crucial factor in the cost of our cities. And since so many of our cities have a housing affordability problem, I think it's worth pausing just for a second to realize where the money is going. We spend so much money on the parking component to modern real estate development. It's amazing there's any money left over for anything else. Um, surface parking lots are still cheaper to build than parking structures, um, which are getting more expensive all the time. And if they're underground, they're even more expensive and so on. So the well, when a developer is forced to build parking that is just for buildings that are sitting there motionless, that cost is gonna get passed on to the end user of the space. So unless you're in one of those rare and lucky places where someone has unbundled the cost of the parking space from the cost of their dwelling unit, where you can rent one or both um, or buy one or both with separate mortgages, unless you, that's very rare, most of the time, you don't even realize you're paying for parking. You're just paying your rent check and or paying your mortgage. And yet the, this huge per unit cost is passed on to the end consumer. Now, why is it done? Well, people need somewhere to park. That's a reason, at least for some of the spaces. Now, if you're the bank, you probably wanna make sure that if this developer fails as they sometimes do, and you have to take back that property uh, in foreclosure and then somehow get rid of it, you probably want some parking spaces because what if a lack of parking made it difficult to lease or sell? So if you're the banker, you might want that. If you're the tenant, you might want some parking. If you're running a restaurant or you're, uh, you're running a store, you're gonna think, how can my customers get here? If you're a really greedy store and you're, and you're thinking short-term instead of long-term, you're gonna say, I want enough parking for the day after Thanksgiving shopping spree um, and I will pave the planet earth to get enough of it if necessary. Um, you know what, all of those uh, who might under the scenarios I just described demand there be some parking, typically demand less parking than the government. The main reason that developers put so much parking in and then have so much cost to pass on to consumers is because zoning requires it. Local governments insist on high minimum parking requirements. There's a lot of reform going on around the country that's getting a little bit better. Um, and, but much work remains to be done at getting government out of the business of uh, regulated minimum parking spaces. Now we will come back to parking again at the end because um, it's impossible to have a conversation about cities without, without addressing it. And I wanted to set the ground for you there where you're thinking if we didn't need so much, we might actually be able to pass that savings along uh, to the end users and lower the per unit cost uh, to produce housing. And we'd have room for other things like start up businesses to have workplaces and green space and more streets with smaller blocks and so on. Next. So now I'd like to talk about what not to do. <laughs> Each time we try to add motoring capacity in order to do something about traffic congestion, the new lanes and the new highways bring more cars and more sprawl and more traffic. So the real question isn't whether you're going to have congestion. Some of the most important streets in your town are going to be congested at peak hour from now until the end of time. At the risk of getting myself in even more trouble about University Avenue, I'm gonna say it again. University Avenue is going to have congestion at peak hour from now until the end of time. And no amount of road widening or pushing the pedestrians and transit users and trees and cyclists either way is ever going to solve it. Next. So the real question is and how many lanes would you finally embrace the inevitability of that congestion and then get on with the business of making livable towns and with making it easy to choose walking, biking, and transit? 
Let's let that sink in for a second. The real question isn't how do we do something about traffic congestion? The real question is, when are you gonna realize that congestion is a normal feature of cities where people deliberately come together for commerce and convenience and because we're social animals when we wanna be with other people? Next. So what should we really do about traffic? The key to managing car traffic isn't focusing on the car traffic. It's focusing on building more complete and connected communities. Communities that have more of the workplaces, the entertainment places, the gathering places, and the housing that we need close at hand. And they would thereby shorten many car trips and even better eliminate others in the process. That's actually just the traditional city. Again, Piccadilly Circus from another angle. Um, but they haven't, he in this place, they haven't tried to push all of the buildings farther apart or to have fewer of them so that they could take up more of the space with parking. They've assumed that the city is the place where people want to be and that it's the people we should be focusing on rather than the cars. Next. I have a, a favorite picture here from Amsterdam. I'm describing the car optional community. That's a place where you can use a car if you want to, when you really need to, but you don't have to, not constantly, to do everything. I used this picture of Amsterdam in utter defiance of a rule among the new urbanists that was uh, only whispered if ever spoken 20 years ago, which uh, sort of a silent agreement. Don't come off like the car hating horse and buggy planners. Um, cars are fine, we like cars. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, it sounded like we were part of a war on cars was not gonna be uh, all that viable to to advance the new urbanism. It seemed much more reasonable to instead talk about everything but that and not to show pictures of Europe because American audiences would tend to see mature cities and say, well, we can't do that, that's Europe. Uh, it's important to remember that when you see scenes like this in Amsterdam, they didn't look like that in 1970. In fact, they were just car sewers filled with, filled with cars, some of them smaller little Dutch cars, but still just, uh, uh, you know, filling up the city with cars, trying to replicate the American city. And even with its unbelievably long story uh, cycling history, the Netherlands had begun to slip away from the car optional community toward the car mandatory community. And they thought better of it and said, we need to change our, our act, we need to approach things differently and build the world that we want. And now they have this amazing economy and an, un, an amazingly low carbon footprint and a high quality of life. Let's go to the next one. Uh, this car optional community I'm talking about is a place where walking is our highest priority mode of transportation. I like to think about pedestrians. It's a funny name, you know, people walking, that's what that really means. I think of pedestrians as a little bit like the canary in the coal mine. They're an indicator species. Um, it, the, um, if the pedestrians fail, like if the canary in your birdcage fails, you know you've got too much gas in your coal mine, um, then everything will fail. When you design a city where pedestrians are happy and places where pedestrians want to be, everything else, and then solve for everything else after that, you will do fine. Um, but if you wait until the end to think about the pedestrians after all the other big decisions are made, like you know the turning radius of the garbage truck or uh, or you know the biggest fire truck imaginable having to thunder down your road at the highest speed possible with its mirrors extended uh, and two of them coming in opposite directions with their outriggers extended. If you start with that, that vehicle and then try to add pedestrian stuff in at the end, you will never get there. So first, the car optional community is one where walking moves to the top of the list of priorities instead of the bottom. Next, the car optional community is a place where people on bikes sometimes known as cyclists, we prefer people on bikes. People on bikes feel welcome and safe. It doesn't actually take a whole lot to do that. Here's a temporary installation with some beautiful flowers and, and uh, planters and some temporary striping, taking extra asphalt and making a bike lane out of it. Um, cycle track you see here was just a temporary pop-up example. And look how safe and welcome Jennifer here on the bike is made to feel the minute that goes in. Next. Our car optional community is a place where transit is provided as if we really mean for people to use it. Well, think about that for a second. 
not just provided because we got to, or you know, we we feel guilty if we don't or something. But provided as if we actually mean for a large percentage of people use it because they think it's cool and better than driving. Next, there are glimmers of what the car optional community can look like. And guess what? They have cars. Uh, this is Glenwood Park in Atlanta. It's a, it's a neighborhood we, we designed uh, a few years ago. And it's been built out uh, in, as a kind of extraordinary contrast to the neighborhoods around it, subdivisions and office parks and industrial areas and so on. In Glenwood Park, they have houses, single family detached houses on relatively normal lots. Uh, they have housing, I mean, that is uh, apartments and apartment buildings. They have row houses, where the houses are touched, touch one another. They have row houses above row houses in which there's two of them, one stacked upon the other in, in a three or four story configuration. They have accessory dwelling units, sometimes known as, um, as granny flats or in-laws quarters. Um, they have mixed use buildings, which have commerce downstairs, like the one on the right here. And then other things like housing or offices or lodging above. They have live work combinations. Right in the middle of this picture is a row of live work units. Um, so that fancy one on the end of the block with all the extra windows around the corner and the roof garden at the top. Well, that's the lawyer's unit. And he's uh, got a great view of the Midtown Atlanta skyline from the top, a place to live on the second and third floor. And then a, an office on the ground floor uh, that he moved his practice into when he was got sick and tired of sitting in Atlanta's car traffic to commute to some shiny glass office building downtown. So all of that con combination, the commercial, the residential, the workplaces, um, the fact that you can get a burger across the street from the lawyer's office, it conspire to reduce the amount of trips. And when people do have to use a car, they make shorter ones. Next. There are glimmers in our historic communities, not just in things that are new. And I, Kristen, in her introduction, generously mentioned Park Avenue and Winter Park. I don't know that the, the ambitious industrialists who started Winter Park uh, realized they were going to, in the process, create a model for what we might make more of our communities like in the 21st century. But if you own an asset like Park Avenue with wide sidewalks and those storefronts and doors and windows facing the street and a tree canopy to make it comfortable to walk even in the Florida sun, guess what? Pedestrians show up uh, and we need more of those conditions. Let's go to the next one. We also can take small sites within the cities that we already have and convert them to things that are a little different from their surroundings. Now, in this picture, the buildings with the gray roofs and uh, are, are the new buildings. And uh, they're surrounded by a leafy suburb of uh, entirely composed of single family detached houses. And the idea here was to insert some housing in the community uh, again, not deliberately looking like the other community, but compatible with it. So this is a very domesticated little village insertion of missing middle housing, that kind of housing that is between the big condo building overlooking um, uh, the river or the ocean uh, and the small single family detached house sitting on its big lot. Here, there are detached houses, but are on very small footprints. And then there are attached houses like the row houses in Glenwood Park. And there are apartments and apartment buildings, that donut shaped building in the middle of your picture. Uh, and there are cottages. So for people who are moving down, wanting less square footage and accessory dwelling units. So um, the idea here is that you could actually create a place where people have aged past the point where they would like to maintain the, the big house on its individual lot and move into something where they have a smaller amount of square footage, maybe it's all on one level and, mm -hmm. and uh, accessible with zero steps, or move into an apartment building uh, or a, even assisted living facility without leaving their community. So they could stay in the community that they know, they could stay near their neighbors where they know people and their congregations are and so on. 21st century community is gonna need to do a lot more for housing diversity or we're going to have to drive a long distance to see grandma like we were doing back in the last millennium. Next. Now, the neighborhood for which that project was designed is this one. It's in South Carolina. And it's fairly spectacular. You know, the, the, uh, they make no bones about the fact that the, um, this is a fancy community and they, they really play up things like 
the ability to walk along the canal where there is no street and they face the fronts of their houses toward that canal, canal street, um, instead of necessarily driving a car everywhere. So it is a prestige item actually to build these better experiences in the space between buildings and housing diversity. And it could even be a prestige item to move buildings closer together instead of farther apart. Next. Of course, uh, we have some walking, biking, and transit going on already in our Sunbelt cities. This is Hammond, Louisiana. Uh, but, I, but I ask you, as we, this is, of course, the best block of Hammond. Have we implemented the physical infrastructure for these Sunbelt cities as if we really mean walking, biking, and transit to be top quality first choices, actually better than driving? And then the follow-up question for that is, what would the world look like if we did? Well, next, it wouldn't look like this. This is a shift change of health workers uh, from working for Baptist Health System, leaving their workplace and trying to make it to either their transit stop or the place where they store their car. And of course, because no one thought about them, there's no really nowhere to cross the street. They just gather in a group on one curb, hope for strength in numbers and start across trying to make eye contact with the motorists in the, through the tented windows um, and scurry across the street. It wouldn't look like that. Next. It also wouldn't look like this. If you look closely at this moment where the cyclist is crossing on the crosswalk um, and uh, the car is turning from the adjacent parallel street, if you look in the back of the picture, you can see the little white man of the pedestrian signal. That cyclist had the right of way just prior to being run off the road just as we snapped the camera for this photograph. It's Kenneth Garcia took that picture at just the right moment. Um, and thankfully no one was hurt, but it's, you don't have to actually be injured. The car doesn't have to collide with you on your bike for you to get the wrong message from the city as communications device in this condition. Next. That city would not look like this. This gentleman uh, is sitting on a bus bench and uh, you can see the bus schedule off uh, just above his head there on the little pole. My friend, Dr. Dick, Dick Jackson, who's a medical doctor out at UCLA, wrote a, wrote a book on sprawl and public health with uh, a CDC officer named Howard Frumpkin. Dr. Jackson would probably say that later today, this gentleman will show up in an emergency room. If not today, then someday soon. And when he gets there, uh, he will be diagnosed with heat stroke or dehydration or exposure or a heart attack or something like that. When what he really has is street tree deficiency syndrome. He has a condition that is induced by the poor design of that bus stop and by the assumption that the transit isn't something that is for everybody, it's just for the people who need to use it as a last resort. And as you can tell from the expression on his face, not having a very good day. Uh, when I, I got this picture, um, snapped the, the shutter and got the picture and then felt bad about it because you, know, you should really ask people first before you take their picture. So went up to him and, and said, excuse me, would you mind if we took your picture? Sort of did it in backwards order the way you're supposed to do that. And, uh, and he turned toward me and smiled like a big grin overtook his face. He was so happy that someone spoke to him, like he had an actual interaction with another human being in that public place, as poor a public place as it is. Um, and of course, he, he agreed. But think about the experience he was having and the message the city was sending him. Next. Now, if we go back to that trail, the West Orange Trail, well, here they set it up to send a different message and they set the community up so it's easy to choose green mobility options. It's as easy as any other option. Next. There's even a term for this among us wonks. The, the term is reducing VMT, vehicle miles traveled. I, I'm sorry about the acronym. It's kind of wonky, I know. What it really means is that we need to find a way to move pe um, more people fewer miles or fewer miles per person. Next. 
And that's what leads us to look at the built environment we've already inherited and think about how to change it from what we know to something else. This is the neighborhood I showed you earlier and what you discover from this before and after set is that it's positioned on top of a failed Kmart um, and an, um, a bankrupt grocery store chain. We're thinking that a lot of the places where you apply the uh, principles of the 21st century car optional city are on parts of the community that we've already built, but we can't reuse in the form that we inherited them. Um, it's not just Kmart. Remember Sears? Remember Circuit City? Remember Lennons and things? I could go on down the list. Uh, they're all disappearing. Next. And I showed you earlier a close up of the same community just to give the idea that in the 21st century community, we don't insist on everything being exactly like everything else next to it. I'm going to actually welcome some attached housing and detached housing in the same neighborhood, along with some places to work or shop. Next. Now, this is a before and after picture for a bigger one of those asphalt scabs. How can we reduce the vehicle miles per person per year? Next. When we hear of a new development bringing higher density and mixed land uses to a transit corridor, instead of just assuming that it will make con traffic congestion worse, we should be scrutinizing it in terms of how well it can be designed to reduce our combined travel in cars, allowing us to shift travel modes. And this way, that's what I meant by saying development can be part of the solution rather than just more of the problem. Now, Americans are conditioned to be suspicious of growth and change because we've been experiencing growth and change that just seems to routinely make um, the world around us worse rather than better. And we got built evidence all around us of that idea. And it's gonna take some convincing to, to um, break us as a nation of NIMBYs out of that mindset. Next. What if each community set an audacious goal? In 2018, South Miami-Dade, the southern part of Miami-Dade County, made about one and a half percent of its trips via walking, biking, and transit combined. Combined. Um, that's unbelievably low and not nearly good enough. But next, what if? What if it didn't always have to be that way? What if we made a societal choice like the ones that were made by the, by the folks in Holland in 1970 or so? What if we shot for 25% within a couple of decades? Why not? Achieving a big goal like that will take a lot of time, but it doesn't require rocket science. Next. Just a little research to show you why we think this is important. Um, the average US household that was near transit saved $9,500 in 2008 per year by using transit instead of driving. And now when you look at a map in terms of greenhouse gases, there are really two views. And I got this from my good friend, the late Hank Dittmar. And I think it's worth looking at. Because for a long time, people thought, well, the way you need to reduce environmental impact is just have less development. Say no to population growth. Say no to that new permit or that rezoning. Just say no. And, uh, you know, uh, old line and established environmental organizations, even the Sierra Club, for decades just filed lawsuits to stop development. Uh, or complained? The answer is population control and less development. And that was because of the old view on the left. The idea was that uh, as we have more people close to go, they have more impacts, more environmental impact on water, or, um, on air, and, and on energy consumption, and all the things we measure in, in terms of environment. Can you back that up one, please, Lauren? Um, the old view on the left is uh, that the city is worse in bright red, but that's just because it was measuring by ache by the area in, instead of uh, by person. The per capita impacts are more like the emerging view on the right. The city dwellers have much lower carbon footprints. They're, they generate relatively low amounts of greenhouse gases. Do you see the difference between these two views? It's actually out in the edge where people are doing the maximum driving that they're having the maximum negative impacts. Next, consuming more acres of farmland and so on. So it's not surprising, given what I just showed you, that when you increase the density, you drop the carbon footprint. Next. It's also a little less intuitive, but people have begun to realize that when you have more intersections, the city is more like a, a web and less like a tree, you, the greenhouse gases go down. 
And when you have more retail within walking distance of people's homes, you, know, you can also make your carbon footprint drop off a cliff. This is why mixed use is important. Next. So we're coming to the punchline. Let's go on to the next one, Lauren. Okay, I'm gonna finish now with my top 10 list of uh, what you need to look for for the car optional 21st century community. Next. First, in the car optional community of the future, you will look again at the land that needs to be recycled and imagine using it more intensively. And I'm going to, to illustrate this idea, I'm going to show you a project in Chattanooga, Tennessee called The Bend. It's on the riverfront adjacent to downtown uh, in a former industrial area. Next. Number 10. Our car optional community is developed around a transit connected mobility hub that links the region to the neighborhood. That means that takes into account the fact that the metropolitan region is still the fundamental economic unit. So we still need to be able to get around and across it. Next, to get to many jobs and other destinations. It means we need ready access to public transit to get there. We'll have to invest in a whole menu of transit options for real this time and spend the money making the transit riders absolutely experience, absolutely great. Go next. Remember each time the a transit rider made the choice to leave their car keys in their pocket or at home, even if you insist on driving yourself, be grateful that they aren't in yet another car blocking your way on the streets. Next. But no matter what our transit technology, we will need walkable places when we exit the train or the bus or the trolley or trackless train or automated vehicle platoon or whatever it is. Transit stations belong at the center of community life where walking is prioritized. Next. In many ways, shaping these cities into the places we know and love, like, uh, for example, uh, the St. Charles streetcar in New Orleans. Go to the next. If you're connecting the metropolitan expanse to the very heart of the city, eventually your transit vehicles, if they're just in traffic, are going to be at a disadvantage. They're no better than driving. Go to the next one. This is Trondheim. What they did was they said one of the lanes is going to be for the bus, and the bus is going to have an advantage. That's transit like you mean it. Next. Now at that hub, it should be easy and convenient to switch to other modes like bikes and scooters and low speed neighborhood circulators and ride share services and maybe some autonomous vehicles um, and the like. Next. Number nine, there are showers. <laughs> Sounds basic, but there's showers and covered bike parking at most workplaces. So in this community, we're describing smart businesses invest in making it easy for their workers to commute by bike, even in hot weather. Next. For the reasons I described at the beginning, I told you we'd come back to parking. That's a lot cheaper than building big, ugly parking structures. Next. So speaking of parking, number eight. In this community, it's right-sized. Um, and the price for storing your car realistically reflects the cost. The goal is to have just enough, not too much. Now, these are examples of transit-oriented development that look more like parking-oriented development because parking was made to dominate it all. Next. My friend Gabe Klein estimates that with autonomous vehicles, we may see the demand for urban parking spaces drop by 85%. Uh, that has a lot of implications. Next. Number seven, our car optional neighborhood is flexible and it's optimized for the new techno mobility, your ride hailing, bike share, scooters, car share, electric vehicles, autonomous and connected vehicles, delivery bots, ultralight vehicles, and whatever's next. And that list I just read out, the phrase, whatever's next, is of course the most important. Flexibility is how you get to that next. And as you know, in Gainesville, uh, it's a whole new world in terms of the, the, uh, the upcoming ability to use low speed electric circulators. But go to the next one. We'll actually have to take full advantage of an exploding menu. It goes far beyond the autonomous vehicle of high tech and compact ways of moving around. The menu will expand. Mobility as a service will expand and will depend on individual cars more or less and less. Go to the next one. I think people are rethinking what transportation is, what a car is, what a train is, and driverless cars are probably the tip of the iceberg. We just have to be firm about what kind of communities we want to create and then harness the technology to help us get them instead of surrendering to the car's needs all over again. Next. Now on our top 10 list, those are the long ones. We're at number seven with that ever-changing list of high-tech stuff. 
but all the remaining features are decidedly low tech, classic, and time tested. And I'll put this list back up for for list uh, for reference a little bit later on. Next, our neighborhood is connected to the surroundings via high quality bike infrastructure. In the foreground here, you see the Blue Goose Hollow Trail, which get, can take you a tremendous distance in Greater Chattanooga. This is where the greenways and trails come in. Next. Those give folks in our neighborhood ways to move to and from surrounding neighborhoods. And next, to get outside for fun and fitness without motoring. Number five, next. This is vitally important. We plant street trees and then we plant more street trees because without the street trees, we can't make the walkable community. Next, street trees make walking more biking pleasant and practical, same for biking. I think of them like essential equipment as in crucial to transit as the transit vehicle. Uh, plus they hold storm water and reduce your energy costs and store carbon and make oxygen and all these cool things. You need to plant a lot more street trees. Next. Walkable sidewalks are important. They should be just as important as the platform that the transit vehicle pulls up beside or the escalators at a metro station or any other piece of equipment we install to get transit up and running. Now naturally street trees were an afterthought for a long time, for decades. So we're trying to overcome that now in new designs. Next. Take a look at the, la at the last block of a popular walking route to the South Miami Metro Station. It looked like this in 1992. And next, now it looks like this. Just think how many more places there are in Florida where we could, this sort of change would be worth making. Number four, our neighborhood has street oriented, street shaping architecture and green comfortable parks and public spaces. You have to ask yourself, if you get that right, who'd ever want to leave? That what you're looking for is right outside your apartment or your office. Number three, the neighborhood is laid out with relatively small blocks in that interconnected web pattern. That means you can get to where you want to go on foot because the grid makes the neighborhood more permeable, like traditional cities. Next. Number two, and this is a big one. This neighborhood has slow, safe, highly walkable, highly bikeable streets. It's not like you, you add the biking and walking after you get it right away. So next, I want you to think about your immediate context in this before and after way, next, and then imagine how you transform the immediate context. And now we're on to number one, completeness. Everything is brought closer together. You have what we need without being pushed far apart, and there are enough souls around to support local commerce and institutions in town. That's how we make the car optional community. Next. We don't have to do that just downtown. We could do that um, uh, in, in the suburbs as a retrofit strategy as well. Um, this is an insertion of a small amount of mixed use and walkable community at the heart of what otherwise is a car dominated scene. So it's not either or, it's both and. Our next, our smart city kind of car optional neighborhood is meant to achieve livable density and, and yet it will still have driving. Driving can be part of the mix. Um, that's why I say car optional. It's a little bit like the clothing optional beach. The sign says you can wear a bathing suit if you want to, but you don't have to. And with that, we've arrived at the at the finish line in my top 10 list. And next one is about is the summary of that. My message to you is that the future is all about choices. And the most important choice is to work together. Okay. That's the end. Thank you, Victor. I, we loved um, having you. Uh, it was a little dicey with Etta coming uh, in your neighborhood, uh, but this was a, a great, um, great springboard for our, our symposium. And I'd like to take a quick uh, a poll, if I could, um, after hearing Victor's um, talk, uh, thinking and seeing what it could be like to live in a car optional community. Um, no right or wrong responses, but how many of you in the audience would be open to having and living in a car optional, car 
car optional lifestyle in your community? I like this scientific poll, a self-selected <laughs> group of research symposium attendees. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what they say. Let's see what we say. I guarantee you it will not be 100%. Like okay. <laughs> is that what you would expect? What uh, do you think? Yeah, uh -huh. it is actually. It is because, yeah. and, and we could take that same poll to, um, you know, to a, 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 um, a suburban congregation in their church meeting or to a group of people walking mm -hmm. by a kiosk in, the, in a shopping mall or whatever. We, get, we would get a similar response. Lots of people want this. There's a pent up demand for it. Um, in fact, the National Association of Home Builders and the National Association of Realtors do a lot of annual research surveys that they send, you know, pollsters out over the whole country and do very carefully, scientifically uh, defensible surveys. And they find something similar. They find that, for example, trails uh, are the number one requested amenity among new home buyers. They find that having places to walk is the most important factor for these days for home buyers and every year they or every two years they repeat those surveys they find the number goes up it's more and more important access to a highway remains important but it's not the most important anymore i have we have time for a, a couple of questions and i wanted just to get the ball uh, rolling if you have a question um please put it into the chat but while we're waiting to get a few questions coming in um how does your narrative work in as we move um, through this pandemic and so much of the allure in making this work are those small, you know, retail opportunities, the little cafes, the coffee shops, uh, the local businesses that really, you know, draw you in and become that third place, that heartbeat of the community. Mm -hmm. um, in your next edition of the street design book, The Art and Practice of Making Complete Streets, you know, after going through this pandemic, it will become part of our all of our narratives. How does that piece work? Have you been thinking about that? Most definitely. Well, uh, so first of all, recognizing what we've all been through over the last few months um, and are still going to be going through for quite some time. When we get to the other end of this national trauma, I think there's going to be a huge outpouring of demand for places to come together in public space, for sitting together, watching the movie, for coming together in a place where there are other people eating uh, in the same restaurant or in the outdoor dining space, people singing hymns in the congregations. There's going to be just a tremendous amount of demand, like a giant sense of relief that will come with uh, bringing the pandemic under control. Uh, vaccines, of course, will help with that. I think there's going to be an awkward transition between the moment between now and the moment when people are comfortable doing that, um, or at least the people who were paying attention to the scientists are comfortable doing that. Um, and that will depend on vaccines and so on. And there's a lot that, that will have to come with that. But you can, I don't think public space is over. I think people are going to want to be back on Main Street. I do think there's come a little bit of a surprise to people just uh, how important walking around was, you know, especially to those who are lucky enough, like some of us in the symposium, to shift quickly to working from home, um, recognizing there are a lot of people who are not so lucky. Uh, did you notice how many more people are walking up and down your street than there were walking on your street, uh, say in February? By the time we got to June, people were just in just pouring into the streets looking for a chance to go out and get some sunshine and fresh air, two great things for combating disease, by the way, um, and, uh, and get a change of scenery and uh, focus their eyeballs on a distance that's greater than the, from their nose to their monitor. And I think all of those things, uh, that outpouring of interest in being outside is reflected a lot of different ways. Some cities, as you know, are converting lots and lots of miles, uh, 75 miles of Oakland are now 
either car free or car light when the, the businesses have been allowed to move out into the to the streets. We just feel like um, you know there's a kind of transitional period. We took the cars and we deprioritized them because there were so many fewer people commuting and used a lot of the space that we assumed was a given, had to be given over to the cars during commutes and started using it for outdoor dining and outdoor vending and, um, and exercise. I think that is an indication that people were always wanting to do those things. They just didn't think they had permission. And I predict it will be difficult to take that back away from them. Now, in the meantime, we will have lost a lot of failed small and local businesses. Um, and that's a, that is an unbelievable tragedy. We're going to be, I think we'll have a, a, a long period of build back. There is an entrepreneurial opportunity for people who always wanted to start one once um, to be part of growing back what was lost. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I, I know in my own neighborhood, we're getting to know each other beyond the name of our dogs and to actually, you know, form this deeper sense of, mm -hmm. of community. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. So let me take one from um, Ariel Hernandez. Uh, she she's asking you, I know some new urban projects are criticized for not having enough affordable housing due to their own economic success. How should those advocating for transit oriented design address the need for affordable housing? Well, it's a multi-pronged um, solution. They're not, there's not just one magic bullet. You can do this one thing and then you'll magically get affordable housing in the mix. First, recognizing that new construction is expensive. So if you're going to have some of it offered below market rate, it's, you're going to have to have some other part of it making more than market rate to make up for it. So traditionally, there's been this kind of um, uh, forced collaboration, let's say, between nonprofit housing providers or government and regulators and the, those who are building new housing. Um, and so it's becoming increasingly common to see uh, affordable workforce housing incorporated in new development as a percentage of the total. Uh, there are some real downsides to that being only accomplished through regulation. I guess the short answer here is if your community and your society put a high priority on affordable housing, um, they're going to have to spend money on that. They need to be prepared to invest in it. And it's not something that you just get by saying, mean old Mr. Bad, Mr. or Ms. Bad developer, you, you have to do it. Uh, because the developer has got to make it up somewhere else in order to do their business. Next, the regulators have a huge role to play here because if housing is more expensive because you have inadvertently increased the per unit land cost by keeping density very low, for example, requiring only single family detached houses or limiting um, heights to such an extreme degree that it's impractical for people to build enough units to um, lower the per unit land cost, then you're part of the problem. And that's why I see, see cities rethinking how much, what a percentage of their land mass is devoted to only single family detached house zoning. So you can fix the zoning, you can help with that problem. Sometimes the, those regulations are where the prohibitions come in that prohibit interconnecting the streets or prohibit accessory dwellings or prohibit attaching the houses, all of which lower it. And the worst of all, the parking, for the reasons I described, if you're requiring a bunch of parking just because you feel like it, or that's your community's mechanism for discouraging growth, you're trying to use the high parking requirements as a disincentive to development, well then don't come complain about affordable housing uh, being short in short supply because you've put this huge cost on housing that uh, you, they can't remove. Take the minimum park parking requirements away. Uh, you can reduce them, better to abolish them. You've given us a lot to think about this afternoon, and I, for one, am looking forward to um, reading reading your book and uh, continuing the continuing the dialogue. Thank you so much for your your time. It was wonderful um, to have you here today, and I knew you. Um, if you could stay just a minute, um, Shimei wanted to thank you as well. Hi, Shimei. Hi, Victor. Uh, that was a fascinating talk, uh, which um, actually sparked a lot of uh, thoughts. I do hope that we'll capture some of the comments in the chat and some of the other questions, because uh, 
I think there will be lots of you who would like to hear a bit more. Uh, personally, I've always been challenged by the fact that um, my first readings of American history had a lot to say about railroads. And then when I turned up here, there were virtually no railroads. Um, and I, I did ask someone and he said, um, in addition to the history of the railroads, there was also the history of the man and his horse. And so now we have mechanized horses. Uh, and so I think there's a sociological study there that relates to that sense of individualism and wanting to be able to go off on one's own and not being limited by the um, kind of group transit. Uh, so that's always fascinated me. Um, so, but I just like to thank you very much for uh, being our keynote speaker this year. We do have um, a little token of our appreciation. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. A plaque which we'll put in the mail to you <laughs> and, um, and something you can remember us by. Uh, well, but you. we do hope that we'll be able to have you back at some time when this uh, pandemic is over and uh, we'll have further discussions on this topic. I Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Okay.